The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. Hear now the word of the Lord as it is found in Habakkuk chapter 3. A prayer, a telephoth of Habakkuk the prophet, according to Shigianus. O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work, O Lord. Do I fear? In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Timon, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heaven, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction. Then the curtains of the land did Midian tremble. Uh, Was your wrath against the rivers, Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses on the chariot of salvation? You stripped the sheath uh, from your bow, calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging water swept on the deep, gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped at the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the scourging of mighty waters. I hear, and my body trembles, and my lips quiver at the sound. A rottenness enters into my bones, my legs tremble beneath me, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vines, uh, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, uh, the flock cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like The deers, he makes me tread on high places to the choir master with stringed instruments. This, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so I have a confession to make. The whole reason that we have been working our way through the book of Habakkuk is to get to here. This is an absolutely incredible passage, which is why we've canceled the second service, because it's just going to take us that long to get all the way through everything that is here. It's so good. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this, your word. What riches are here. What a revelation of who you are and what you have done. Seal it in our hearts that we may trust and obey. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thomas Guthrie, great Scots theologian and pastor, wrote... If one were compelled to choose a single passage in the Bible to condense into just a few verses the very essence 
of theology, into an outline of the character and nature of God, into a synopsis of the biblical worldview, one might be inclined to choose Romans 1 or 3 or 8, or or perhaps the third chapter of John's gospel, or Ephesians 1, or Philippians 2, or Colossians 1, or Isaiah 53, or even Genesis 1 through 3, all would certainly be worthy of consideration. But one could also do well by choosing the final chapter of Habakkuk's prophecy. For herein, pressed into the compact space of just 19 verses, is a survey of providence, past, present, and future. Herein is portrayed a holy fear of the sovereign Lord of creation, of history, of justice, and of redemption. Herein is summarized a scriptural world and life view. The breadth and depth and width and height of this psalm is stunning. Indeed, it is. The first thing to notice, of course, about Habakkuk chapter 3 is that it is a psalm. A psalm outside of the book of Psalms. Now, we we know that there are several different types of psalms. Uh, There are maskils, uh, which are wisdom psalms, like Psalm 32, 42, and 78. There are hallel psalms, uh, psalms of praise, like Psalm 113, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, Psalm 146. There are miktams. Uh, They are psalms that are a plea for mercy, like Psalm 16, 56, 57, 58. But Habakkuk tells us that his psalm is a shigioneth, like Psalm 7. Uh, The word shigion uh, literally means reeling. And a shigioneth psalm was a kind of dirge. It was a psalm of mourning, oftentimes a funeral psalm. But he also tells us that, that this psalm is a prayer, a tefala, like uh, Psalms 86, 90, and 102. This is a, a prayer petition. That's why as we make our way through this shigioneth, we start to realize that it's not all mournful, that in fact, it turns to praise. You you may have noticed uh, the musical or liturgical notations uh, that run all through the passage. At the very end, we're told in verse 19 uh, that this is a nasa, it is uh, for the choir master. And again, in verse 19, it is a niganoth. Uh, Literally, it's a psalm to be played on stringed instruments. This was a psalm that was literally written for the people to worship the living God in a time of deep distress and impending doom. Notice, too, in verses 3, 9, and 13, uh, there is that unusual musical or liturgical notation, Selah. Uh, Scholars aren't certain what Selah actually means. If it is derived from the Hebrew word Salal, it probably means to lift up. It's like a forte or a crescendo. It's at a point where in the mournful dirge, suddenly eyes are lifted up and the music picks up its pace, it crescendos. If, on the other hand, Selah comes from the Hebrew word Salah, literally a rest, then at this point, we're supposed to pause and make notes. It's a long musical rest. 
Now, in this psalm, what we see is an incredibly intricate and complex structure. There are three stanzas. Uh, The first stanza is in verses 1 through 7. The second stanza, verses 8 through 15. The third stanza is verses 16 through 19. And each of the three stanzas, in turn, has three parts. Uh, So the first stanza is broken up, verses 1 and 2, and then verses 3 and 4, and finally verses 5 through 7. The the other thing to notice is just this uh, peculiar an incredibly powerful literary nature in this psalm. Uh, For instance, the psalm uses past tense, present tense, and future tense as it moves through the psalm. Uh, So past tense, you'll notice, in verses 3 through 15, present tense in verse 16, and then concluding with future tense in verses 17 through 19. Uh, But the psalm begins uh, with past, present, and future all together in verse 2. I heard, past, I fear, present, and revive in the midst of the years, O Lord, your work, future, all in verse 2. Also notice uh, that uh, the structure of uh, the story and the nature of its tense changes uh, through the use of pronouns. Did you notice that? Third person singular is featured in verses 3 through 6. There, it's all about uh, the Lord, spoken of in third person, he and his. But then we have second person singular, uh, you and yours, in verses Uh, 8 through 15. And then first person singular in verses 1 and 2. And concluding in verses 16 through 19. And then punctuating right in the middle in verse 7. I and my. Uh, Louis Untermeyer, the great anthologist of poetry, has said, Great poetry always has the appearance of simplicity while simultaneously maintaining a deceptive complexity. You read this psalm and you're likely to to miss all of these details because it's so full of blood and thunder. Uh, You're you're, you're likely to get caught up in the storyline and miss the brilliance of the way the story is put together. But of course, the great story of Habakkuk chapter 3 really is the story. This is a psalm that tells us who God is. He's the Holy One, verse 3. He's the creator of heaven and earth, the everlasting hills, verse 6. He is the great warrior who comes to bring justice and redemption for his people, verses 8 through 15. And in the end, he does indeed remember mercy in the midst of the wrath. He revives his work in the midst of the years. He is the redeemer, the God of salvation, verses 17 through 19. Habakkuk, in this incredibly complex and beautiful poem, full of blood and thunder, tells us just what God has done. But what he has done in creation, verse 6. What he has done for his people in the Exodus, verses 8 and 15. In the conquest of the land, verses 11 and 12. During the days of the judges, verse 7. And the establishment of the kingdom, verse 13. He takes a, a, a wide sweep of the whole of the ancient world. There is Edom in verse 3, Sinai in verse 7, Midian in verse 7, Canaan in verse 8, Egypt in verses 8 and 15, Aram, the world of the Amorites in verse 11. It encompasses the whole work 
of all of the heroes of the faith, from Moses in verses 3 through 5, uh, to Joshua in verse 11, to Othniel in verse 7, uh, to Gideon in verse 7, and David at last in verse 13. You saw all of that, right? It's incredible. The whole point of Habakkuk is to show that God is sovereign. He exercises his providence at all times and in all places. The thrust of this is to give us a sense of awe and wonder at the comprehensiveness of God's eternal decrees and the execution of those eternal decrees in space, in time, and in history. This is the biblical worldview. Here, uh, we see the omnipotence of God, the omniscience of God, the omnipresence of God, This is a passage that tells us who, what, when, where, and how. Tells us who God is, what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will yet do, and how he has revealed himself to sinners like us in the midst of this poor, fallen world. The gist of it all boils down to the fact that when Habakkuk considers all these things, he is utterly stricken with fear. Do you notice that? Verse 2, he fears the work of the Lord. And then in verse 16, he's trembling, he's quivering, he's reduced to a puddle in the face of Almighty God, which is uh, precisely what we see over and over and over again in every theonophic uh, uh, event. Uh, when, when, when God appears in a theophany, God's people fall on their faces before him. The, the whole psalm actually mirrors in some ways the, the song of Moses. The Song of Moses is uh, one of those threads that is woven all through the scriptures. It begins in Exodus chapter 15. Now there, uh, the Lord God Almighty, having triumphed over uh, Egypt and Pharaoh, uh, declares uh, uh, the, the, the Lord has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider fell into the sea. The Lord is a warrior. And then there's Deuteronomy chapter 30, 31, and 32, uh, the Song of Moses, uh, where uh, the Lord declares uh, that he is sovereign over all, that he has established his kingdom, and that he will rescue his people evermore. And then there's uh, Psalm 90. Number your days. Teach us, O Lord. To number our days. And and then uh, we have uh, this incredible conclusion to the Song of Moses in Revelation chapter 15. Verses 3 and 4. Moses comes and he stands uh, before the great throng in heaven. Around the glassy sea are assembled all of those who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb And Moses breaks out one final time in his great song. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the ages. Who will not fear you? Who will not worship and bow down before you? For your righteous deeds have been made known. And all nations will come and they will worship before you. For you alone are holy. You alone, O Lord. Habakkuk references these all the way through uh, the whole of the passage. And he falls down 
in holy fear. Job tells us in Job 28, uh, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. Psalm 111 and Proverbs chapter 9 both tell us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 15, the fear of the Lord is instruction for wisdom. Proverbs 10, uh, the fear of the Lord prolongs life. Uh, The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Proverbs 14, uh, the fear of the Lord is a treasure. Isaiah 33, in the fear of the Lord there is strong confidence. Proverbs 14, how blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, Psalm 128. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him, Psalm 33. In the modern world, we treat God as our buddy, our pal. We're quick to say, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And it's true. But even that should stun us. The marvel of it, that the maker of heaven and earth, that the one who flung the stars into the places, and the one who in Every instance throughout all of history in every place uh, demonstrates justice and power and glory and majesty that he should choose the likes of us should stun us. It did Habakkuk. And even as he sang, he trembled. He was undone. It is the fear of the Lord that enables us to walk in his ways. It's the fear of the Lord that enables us to quicken our hearts to praise him in the midst of all of the hubbub of ordinary life. It's the fear of the Lord that enables us with the voice of the psalmist, with the voice of Habakkuk to say, Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Now, you notice that this uh, psalm is uh, simultaneously a prayer. Uh, R.C. Sproul has said it's actually a model for us in prayer. He says, Habakkuk uh, may be called the forefather of the Reformation. The key concepts of his preaching had taken over by the Apostle Paul, deeply influenced Martin Luther and John Calvin, and eventually became watchwords of the Reformation. The just shall live by faith. Uh, The the glory of the knowledge of God uh, shall cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. Uh, Revival, Lord, your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, bring mercy and not just wrath. But he goes on and he says, Habakkuk uh, particularly influenced the reformational theology of prayer. Indeed, his song of praise for God's good providence in the third chapter of the prophecy reflects the third portion of the Lord's prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Habakkuk models for us humble prayerfulness, submitting and rejoicing in God's will and the temporal outworking of his eternal plans and decrees. It is the quintessence of the fear of God. And notice, uh, this prayer is rooted in the word of God. As Habakkuk prays, he's quoting back to God passages like Exodus 15, Deuteronomy 32, Psalm 90, Joshua 10, uh, Judges 3, 6, and 8. He's crying out to God in the word of God, with the words of God. And his petitions are remarkable. 
because Habakkuk knows that his people are wicked. That the nation is sure to fall under the bar of the justice of God. And so his prayer is not, Lord, help us be better. His prayer is not, oh, Lord, change the structure of the Supreme Court. His prayer is for God to remember his covenant keeping. To revive the divine work in wrath to remember mercy. Here, the prophet simply cries out for God to save. He lived in perilous times, as we've seen. The end of the 7th century, the beginning of the 6th. It was a terrible period of convulsion, of social upheaval, and of a cultural downgrade. There were dangers without, and there were dangers within. Egypt and Assyria engaged in unending and calamitous imperial wars against the rising specter of the Chaldeans, that fierce and destructive people, the Babylonians. The kingdom of Israel had already been conquered. The ten northern tribes had been dragged off into captivity to Nineveh. Though Judah had undergone remarkable revival and renewal in the generation prior, the reforms of Josiah were now a distant memory. And Judah had fallen into the same sort of cultural degeneration and downgrade that had brought judgment upon Israel. Judah was a culture that was full of lies and deception and manipulation and Hamas. That sort of brutal, senseless violence. that has no explanation other than pure, unadulterated wickedness. In these perilous times, Habakkuk cries out, O Lord, the bar of justice is even now upon us. We see it at every turn. He starts to go through the list at the very end of the chapter. The economy has gone south. Fruit trees are no longer bearing. Grapes are no longer giving their fruit. The olive trees have dried up. There are no herds in the stalls. The whole culture seems to be collapsing right before their eyes. It's happening so fast that they can hardly take it in. Sound familiar? This last week, the doomsayers and soothsayers could have had a feast, right? The horrific death of a beloved pastor here in Middle Tennessee, Thomas McKenzie. Hurricane Ida, even now, making landfall in Louisiana on the anniversary of Katrina. The horrors that have unfolded in Afghanistan. The rebuke that we have received from nations all around the world for the first time ever ever, including back during the War of 1812 and the War for Independence, uh, there were stirring rebukes of the United States in the British Parliament. 
He didn't even do that when George Washington was leading troops against the Redcoats. We have a surging pandemic and nobody, nobody, not Dr. Grant and not Dr. Fauci, understands a bit about it. Every single business that I know of has a sign out saying, help desperately wanted. For us, Habakkuk's psalm is incredibly pertinent. Matthew Henry put it this way. Habakkuk supposes the ruin of all his creature comforts and enjoyments. Not only of the delights of life, but even of the necessary supports of it. The fruit tree withered. The fig tree barren. The olive tree failed. The bread corn failed. Cattle perishing uh, for want of food. The flock is cut off from the field. And there is no herd in the stall. But when all is gone, his God is not gone. Note, the joy in God is never out of season. Nay, it is in a special manner seasonable when we meet with losses and crosses in the world. Uh, that it may then appear that our hearts are not set upon these things or our happiness bound up in them. Uh, Thus the prophet, who began his prayer with fear and trembling, concludes it trembling with joy and triumph. Because he knows that in the midst of wrath, he will remember mercy. And he has. For a people that did not deserve it, that did not warrant it, God sent his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us the righteous for the unrighteous. The gospel is good news. It's always good news. It's what we always need to hear because it is that that causes us with Habakkuk to fall on our faces with a sense of awe. Thomas Guthrie says it well. Herein, compressed into the space of just 19 verses, is a survey of providence, past, present, and future. Herein is portrayed a holy fear, a sovereign Lord of creation, of history, of justice, and of redemption. Herein is summarized the scriptural world and life view. Herein is summarized the gospel, the good news. There is hope for us in the midst of a world filled with peril. So what should we do? How should we respond? Habakkuk reminds us our first response is to him, not to them, to him. Our second response is to our own hearts. In times of peril, when everything seems to have gone mad, our first response should be to repent ourselves. And then third, we do our job. Notice, Habakkuk didn't keep this to himself. 
He wrote this tefala. He wrote this shigioneth. He wrote it as a niganath, uh, to be played on stringed instruments. It is for the choir master. He beckons everyone to join him. He goes to work. He does his job. In this day and time, the most important things that we can do is respond to him, respond in repentance, and do our job. And God is responsible for all the rest. This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpresbyterian.org.